So, how's everybody doing this morning? Good. Uh, the, as Steve said, he did have uh, just a minor uh, operation done this week, and so, so he could have some time to rest. He asked me to speak, and so I appreciate the opportunity. <coughs> and we are going to continue on the series that he started on Christianity 101, where we talk about some of the, just the, the, the key concepts when it comes to God, church, Christianity, and those things. And today, what I want to talk to you about is the Bible. And there are a lot of misconceptions about the Bible. There's a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, there's a lot of fears. And I'm hoping to address those and just kind of talk about some of those things and alleviate some of those things as we go through it. And one of the things that uh, I want to talk to you about first is, so I was, because uh, there, there are just a lot of misunderstandings. And just a few weeks ago, I was in Bolivia. And I was, along with some other pastors, I uh, had an incredible opportunity to teach other pastors that live there how to read, interpret, and understand the Bible, and then teach that to others. Uh, so I enjoyed myself very much. Uh, the food was amazing. There's a lot of pictures of the food. Not the people so much, but the food. And I also love the people themselves. They, they're, just, they're just great. They're, just, they're, they're happy. Uh, and they have an incredible sense of humor, uh, which I enjoyed very, very much. My translator, his name was Enzo. He was really the translator for everybody. Uh, but he and I really hit it off. We have a lot of similarities. He's a nerd. He likes all, you know, all things superheroes and comics and that kind of stuff. Uh, he loves uh, comedy and stand-up and that kind of thing. We talked about that. And we also share a common passion, uh, which is screwing with people. Uh, just really enjoy that a lot. Uh, honestly, I don't think life offers anything sweeter. And one of the things that he was telling me about is how, so his, his grandparents, uh, who are very good Christians, he visits them often, loves them very much, but he goes and he visits them, and they always watch the same things. Uh, they're strong Christians, and so they, they will only watch a movie or a TV show that they deem Christian. And so they're kind of in that stage of life where they're staring at the TV, they're in matching recliners, eating Cheetos, watching Matlock, you know what I mean? And so he was at their house, and they were watching the same thing, and he just couldn't take it anymore. And he said, hey, uh, I know a movie that we could watch. They said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, it's a Christian movie. They said, really, what is it? And he said, it's called John Wick. Really, what is it about? Oh, well, it's about a man who goes out and he tells people about Jesus. And if they don't accept Jesus, he shoots them. Here's where it gets weird. They said, yeah, that sounds like a good movie. Let's watch it. I don't want to, you know, spoiler alert, but it's, it's, that's not what it's about. It's about a man and his dog, and 500 million rounds of ammunition that he disperses very freely among all the folks. Um, he shoots them in the face. So here's the best part. They are a full hour into this movie when they look at him and go, I don't think this is a Christian movie. And he goes, no, it isn't. <laughs> I just got really tired of watching the same thing. So I intentionally deceived you. There's a, we have these, these, we're told things about the Bible that simply aren't quite true. And we have these expectations of the Bible that aren't true. Kind of like how he kind of led them to believe a certain thing about the movie. And so what I want to do is I want to remove some of those misconceptions that we're all guilty of. And we all have a tendency to fall into that trap, okay? And I'm choosing my pronouns very carefully here. We need to make sure that we approach the Bible correctly because I fall into that trap just as much as anyone else. We're going to talk about what some of those traps are. There's a few points that I want to make, and I, I hope that as we go through this, I especially want to alleviate some of the fears that come as we approach the Bible. But in the back as you came in, uh, you may have seen a... Um, a bulletin, and it will have the notes and the, the verses of Scripture, because I'll be kind of hopping all over the place in the Bible uh, as we look at certain topics. Uh, but you can also pull up the notes online at this link, and you can even type in some notes as we go along. But 
Uh, we're going to be talking about the Bible and its basics and what the Bible really is, okay? What the Bible really is, and when we know that, how we should approach it. So let's dive right in. First off, the Bible is about God and his character. First and foremost, first and foremost, the Bible is about God and about his character. Okay? In other words, it's not primarily about us. Very often that's how we approach scripture. But it's about God and his character. There are many verses of scripture that, that point to this. And I'll read to you from Psalm 95. It says this. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. This, of course, is God. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. And that's just part of that song. And one of many places that reflect how God is the ultimate priority. He is what the Bible is about. It's not about us. And how it is his witness to himself. So that we may understand him better, grow in our relationship with him, and love him more. And if we approach scripture from it being about us, we're going to have problems and we're going to have some misunderstandings. And I understand. I get it. I understand how you'll be going through something. There's some kind of difficulty. There's some kind of problem. And you, and you go to the Bible and you're like, Lord, give me something. Give me something, please. Something about this, something, you know, just some kind, of, some kind of word, some kind of encouragement, some kind of something, some kind of direction, some kind of give me something. Give me, give me, give me. And I think that we sell ourselves short when we approach the Bible that way because it really is ultimately about him. Again, while I was in Bolivia, I was talking to them about just how to do some of the, pulling some of the principles that come from Scripture so that we can live by them. But it was also a time when I taught to, to also encourage them. Because some people hold the Bible with a bit of trepidation. They're, they're, they're nervous. They're, they're worried that they're not going to understand it. And so one of the things that I discovered, again, through uh, my translator Enzo, as we were talking, he said, you know, people here in Bolivia, they have a hard time reading Revelations for two reasons. And some of us have those same reasons. One, it scares them. Okay? There's some, there's some frightening imagery in the Bible. And also because they're afraid that they won't understand it. So as I was speaking to them, I said, they're both, I have my iPad and my iPhone up here. They're both talking to me. I've never had that happen in all the years <laughs> that I have been preaching. All right. Shut up, Siri. All right. So, the, uh, where was I? All right. Oh, Revelations. That's where I was. So, I, I pulled them together and I said, look, I understand it's a frightening book. But if you, I just want to summarize Revelation for you in two words. God wins. God wins. Because we are co-heirs with him through Christ, we win as well. And I don't care what the horror movies tell you. God is not in some epic struggle against evil. There will come a point where he eliminates all evil as easily as a child blows out a birthday candle. But you cannot approach Revelation with, it scares me. You can't approach Revelation from the outside, I won't understand it. It's about God and understanding him and knowing who he is. One of the things that we said multiple times while we were speaking to people is, does God want to be known. And they would say, yes, of course he does. Then approach the Bible that way. It's about him. When you take a look at the story of David and Goliath, do you come away with the idea of, yes, even I, I can overcome great obstacles, or do you come away with the idea that it is God who does the slaying? 
that he is the one that is ultimately in control. That he is the one that has me. Do you see the difference? It's about God and his character. This isn't in your notes. But Matthew 6.33 makes it very clear. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added to you. This is in the middle of a passage where Jesus is talking about how we worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, our image, our livelihood, all of these things. And he says, don't put that as your main priority. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Then all of these things will be added to you. So it's not just about God and his character. It's about us as well. Okay? A lot of pastors say, well, it's only about God. Well, no. We're in there too. We're going to take a look at that. But first and foremost, it is about God. Okay? We must, we must, we must approach it from that mindset. And we must remind ourselves to approach it from that mindset because, like I said, there are many times I go to the Bible and I'm going through something just like all of us, just like we're all going through something. We've all got a disagreement with someone. We've all got this problem. We've all got this thing that we want to fix. And we want to go to the Bible and we go, all right, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. Come on, God, give me, give me something. And sometimes we have to approach it from the standpoint, okay, God, in this situation, what do you want me to do? Okay. So, next point is this. The Bible is about God's work to redeem mankind through his son, Jesus Christ. It is about God's work to redeem mankind through his son, Jesus Christ. You can grab the most staunch atheist, hand them the Bible, have them read it, and they will tell you what the Bible is about. This is a clear theme through all of Scripture, how we were made in a perfect world and how we fell from grace and how God has been working to bring us back into that relationship, everyone, from the very beginning. And how it is about him. And how, and I need to pause here for just a moment. Steve talked about one of the concepts that he talked about in this Christianity 101 series is the cross. And so he spoke about that last week. If you haven't watched it, I encourage you to do so because it talks about how Christ died for all of us and how this is, the, this is the plan for God to redeem us through his son, Jesus Christ, and how everyone everywhere has the ability to be saved, that grace is offered if they are simply willing to accept it, okay? That was the message, and I encourage you to watch it if you haven't yet, but understand that this is what it's about and how all of Scripture points to Christ. We read in Luke 24, 27, it says this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets. And let me just stop here for a moment. This is between that moment where Jesus is raised from the dead. There's for 40 days before he ascends, he is speaking to his disciples and telling them what they need to do to prepare for when he is gone, but also how all of Scripture points to him. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning himself. He talked about Moses, and he said and how Moses stood between God and the people and tried to redeem them through the law, but I have made a better way. I am the better Moses, and I bring redemption through sacrifice. He talks about how the temple was just a type of him, and it was a way for the people to meet God, but now you can meet God anywhere you are. You don't have to go to a tabernacle. Now you can talk to God anytime you want to through me. He talks about how he is uh, even in Esther, how Esther was willing to give up everything in order to speak to the king. But Jesus said, I will give up everything so that you can have that relationship with God. And he goes through all of the scriptures and shows how he is the better prophet, the better priest, the better king, the better sacrifice. And all of that converges and points to Christ. His sacrifice, his resurrection, and his ascension to the right hand of God how that is what it is about. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says this. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, that is of first importance, and if you don't believe that, then there's a problem. If that isn't true, then we are to be pitied. We're fools. Going through the motions, but that is not true. Now, all of scripture points to God's plan to redeem us through his son, Jesus Christ. Third, the Bible is our authority and the will of God for our lives. The Bible is our authority and the will of God for our lives. And if I could have you change one thing in your notes, add our ultimate authority. Our ultimate authority. I, there's so much that, more that I could say that, but I'm going to try and sum this up very, very succinctly. It's the simple fact that we have many authorities in our lives. We have our parents uh, for a time. We have our bosses. We have our government. We have all of these things, right? And yet, our ultimate authority is Scripture. It is God's Word for our daily living so that we can live our best life. And let's be honest, there are people that have a difficult time with that have a hard time with that. They would rather, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not intentionally, they would rather pick and choose what parts of the Bible they want to listen to. Sometimes they just have their favorite parts. Sometimes they have parts they don't understand or it scares them, like the book of Revelation, and so they just avoid it. But the point is this, is that all Scripture is for us so that we can live under that authority. In fact, we're told that very point blank in 2 Timothy. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and teaching in righteousness, so that the servant of God, that's us, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And we cannot cherry-pick the parts that we like and just hold on to those. What that means is simply this. Scripture stands over and in judgment of all our stuff. All our thoughts, all our actions, all our biases, all our beliefs. All the things that we do, our hobbies, whatever it may be, it stands over it and says yes or no. Every bit of it. You know, one of the things that I hear from, uh, and I hear it from counselors, I hear it from psychologists, I hear it from psychiatrists, um, and if you don't know the difference between those three, well, you're living a great life. Uh, but one of the things that I hear from them, Christian or not, is what well, you, can't, you can't tell someone how to feel. You can't tell someone how to feel. How can you do that? And the first time I heard that, I thought about it for about 10 seconds, and I thought, yes, you can. The Bible does it all the time. All the time. There are things that we should strive to feel, and there are things that we should strive not to feel. Um, the, in Galatians 5, it says that we should not have hatred, we shouldn't have jealousy, we shouldn't have fits of rage, we shouldn't have selfish ambition. We shouldn't have envy, but what should we have? We should have, according to verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are actions and feelings. In Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything. Don't worry. Instead, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, with gratitude, present your request to God. Don't worry about all the stuff. That's a feeling to avoid. Instead, have gratitude. In 2 Timothy 1.7, for the Spirit of God does not make us timid or give us a, a spirit of timidity, but it gives us power and love and self-discipline. The Bible tells us, because I began to kind of dig into this when, he, when, when I first heard that, and I realize that the Bible tells us how to feel all the time. All the time. 
And it seems very altruistic. It seems very charitable to, 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 to tell a person, well, no, you, you know, you can just feel any way that you feel. You can just kind of believe in any way. That you, but it's not. Very often I hear, you know, the, uh, one of the things that I hear is, you know, well, you know, that's just Susan. You ever heard that? I, you know what that means? Or, or, or that's just Tom. You know what that means? I mean, Susan and Tom are jerks. You know what I mean? They just, they're just like, oh, well, you know, that's just them. They're not going to change. And let me tell you how to be like Susan or Tom. Are you ready? By saying these simple words. Well, that's just the way I am. You ever heard somebody say that? It's just the way I am. In other words, I refuse to believe that I can change or grow even though the Bible tells me differently. And they just kind of give up. And they go, well, you know, I just, I'm just angry. I'm just, I just have these, you know, I just have these moments of rage. Everybody's just going to have to get used to it. You're just going to have to deal with it. Sorry. Yeah, I gossip sometimes. I talk about people. But you know what? That's just me. That's just what I do. Sorry. Everyone's going to everyone's gonna have to deal with it. But there's one thing I never want people to say about me is, well, that's just Barry. It's the last thing I want anyone to say. Here's another phrase that I hear. Well, and especially in the South. Well, that's just the way I was raised. That's just the way my mama raised me. In my upbringing, in my culture, I was raised to be racist. Very racist. Not cross-burning racist, but racist. And I was told on a continual basis that I am better than certain other people simply because of the complexion of my skin, my Elmer's blue complexion. It's ridiculous. So do I just say, well, that's what mom and dad told me, or that's what these people taught me, and then that just makes it all go away? That just makes it all right? No. Our, our ultimate authority and the will of God for our lives so that we may live our best selves. There are things that as we look at our lives and, and those things that we're, we're, we may be involved in, that we just stop and we say, is this okay with God? Is this something that I need to work on? Is this something I need to change? Am I willing to allow God to, to speak into my life so that I can make those adjustments? Last is this. It is our means of true fulfillment in life. It is our means of true fulfillment in life. says in Romans 15, verse 4, it says this, for everything that was written in the past, meaning the scriptures, okay? For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Encouragement, endurance, and hope. Meaning that there is a work that takes place as we read God's word. What we interact with, what we read, what we interact with, has an effect on us. It has an effect on us. I don't know if they're still talking about this or not, but for a while there, or maybe they still are, uh, but our government was talking about whether or not we should allow TikTok to be legal in the United States because of the influence and the negative influence that it is having on people who watch it. I, and let me tell you, I, I just have a, a news feed that I just kind of scroll through every now and again, and every week, every week, there's at least one article that says, okay, this is what TikTok is saying this week, please don't do that. Don't do it. Uh, and so, you know, because people are doing it. 
because there are people on those channels, they just kind of spout whatever nonsense will give them thumbs up or likes or smiley faces or whatever. Because what we interact with has an effect. Whether it's, it's media, movies, whatever it may be. And so we have to make sure that we are careful about what we expose ourselves to. Howard Hendricks says this, God wants to communicate with you in the 21st century. He wrote his message in a book. He asked you to come and study that book for three compelling reasons. It's essential for growth, it's essential for maturity, and it's essential for equipping you, training you so that you might be an available, clean, sharp instrument in his hands to accomplish his purpose. So the real question confronting you now is, how can you afford not to be in God's word? And as I read through the word, if I'm going through that problem, that situation, that circumstance, whatever it may be, and I approach it with the idea of just, you know, God, please, just give me something. Very often what I find, what I need to do is take a step back and just remind myself who God is and allow that to speak to my heart. Allow that to take its place. Allow that to work in me. As I allow myself to be exposed to the scriptures, that endurance, that encouragement, and that hope come to me. I don't always get an answer. There are times where I'm reading through the Bible and there's a revelation and I realize something, you know, just kind of, just kind of grabs you and it's, I love those moments. But then there are times, there are many more times where I don't get that revelation, I don't get that answer, and I just have to say, okay, God, I'm going to believe you've got this. Remember, there are times where we have to kind of stop as we're in those situations and we want God to say something, give us something. Sometimes we have to ask, God, what can I give you? I don't understand the situation, but what would you have me do? What is it that will seek first your kingdom and your righteousness in this situation? Closing, I, I just want to point out that I've kind of put these points in a specific order. That the Bible is about God, about his plans to redeem mankind through his son Jesus Christ. How it is our authority, it is for our fulfillment. But very often what we do is we turn those around. Our first thought is we seek our fulfillment. You know, we're looking for that, we're looking for that, that greeting card Bible verse that can give us kind of a little dopamine burst and we can just kind of keep going on. But that's not what it's for. We have to realize that we have to put God first. You know, I told you in Bolivia they've got a great sense of humor and while I was there they told me a joke. Enzo said, you know, I have the ability to change traffic lights from red to green with just the power of my mind. But sometimes it takes a while. I'm glad you got that. I was going to leave if you didn't. It's a very simple joke. And I love that joke because the, you know, it's this idea that I have this control when really I don't. There's something going on behind the scenes. And, and God is the one who is behind the scenes. He's the one that is working within us. He is the one that is working out his will in our lives. He is the one that's giving us uh, power through his spirit. He is the one that is doing so many things. And we, we come to him very often with this idea of seeking fulfillment first. With the idea of, you know, Lord, let's work on how this benefits me. Then we'll talk about you. And there's a, let's say, stunted means of approaching the Bible, at the very least. My encouragement to you is that you put God first. God, what would you have me do? And allow him to speak to your heart as you search the scriptures. We must 
put these things in the proper order. Yes, the Bible is about us, but secondarily, God is first. What would you have me do in this situation? And I want to encourage you, just like, you know, just like these students in Bolivia, which I just, I can't tell you how much fun I had uh, teaching them. We had people of all ages. Uh, we had people in their 70s, and we had teenagers. And they, they just kind of hung on every word of every teacher and how they were just hungry to know God's word and how to interpret it and how to live it and how to share it with others. It was just an incredible thing. You know, they're just, you know they, were just, they, were, they were leaned in and ready to just soak in all the knowledge. It was fantastic, and I loved it. And I also know their fear. I know that they had some fears about approaching the Bible correctly and how there's some things that they don't understand. There's some things that might be a little bit scary and I know that you have those same concerns. I know that sometimes you approach the Bible and it's like, ooh, I don't know. Or maybe you, know, you just don't know where to start. Uh, there are resources that will help you with that. There are Bible apps that are very good. They can give you some Bible studies. Steve has written a book on uh, taking that first time through the Bible and understanding it. And he gives kind of synopsis of each of the Bible so that you can kind of learn how to read and understand and apply and interpret correctly, but start somewhere. I guarantee you, because I never have, and you never have, and you never will, you will never meet a mature Christian that does not read the Bible on a regular basis. Very often, I see it so often, people come here, they come looking for answers, there's something going on. But they're not really willing to engage with God's word. And they're looking for that fulfillment. They're looking for that purpose. They're looking for that joy. And they're just stuck in this middle class rut that just seems to go nowhere. And they don't know what to do about it. And they don't engage with God's word. So my encouragement to you is start somewhere. Does God want to be known? Yes. Does he want you to know him? Yes. Find a place. Find a place to start. Philippians is a great book to start in. John is another great place to start. But start. In closing, I want to remind you that uh, we have communion stations. There's one here, one here, maybe one there. And it's just a, it's a great opportunity uh, to, to remind yourself of that commitment that you've made to God through Christ. A reminder of the, of the commitment that you've made in that relationship. And so that's something that we make available every single week. Also, we have a cross. If you'd like to spend some time just kind of uh, meditating on this, praying about what God might have you do next, uh, the cross is always open. Please feel free to go there and uh, spend some time in prayer. But ask yourself, God, what would you have me do? Let's pray. Father, pray that you would remind us of the importance and the splendor and the gift that is your word this is not to hone us in Father this is not to, to, to imprison us but, but really to set us free Christ told us that he came to give his life and to have it to the full I pray, Lord, that as we seek out your word and understand it and allow it to speak to our hearts, that we can live it out in our lives, that you would show us what this really means, to live by your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.